So Asian Valley, uh, this is uh, going to be kind of a, a contained tour. It's going to be all within Asian Valley. So um, you know, we can talk about a lot of plants. You can you can ask me about anything while I'm there. Uh, this is a uh, this is one of those generic titles I gave um, when I, Chris asked me to give him lecture topic, um, tour topics six months in advance. I knew in October I'd probably be leaving for Asia, so uh, I figured this would be a, a good time to, to do that. So on uh, Saturday, I will be, instead of being here for the giveaway, I will be on a plane uh, on my way to um, Shanghai. So. Uh, so I can get more plants to give away to everybody. Um, but yeah, so, so I won't be able to do that. So this is, this is to get me prepared uh, for the, the trip to China. So while we're in Asian Valley, um, we're on our way there. Feel free to ask any questions you have. Doesn't have to be about what I'm talking about. Uh, it can be about anything. Also, please give input, feedback on any of these plants. If there are things you've, you've grown um, that you disagree with what I say about it, you know, um, Please do that. Please let me know. Uh, there's always things that uh, surprise you. You know, we have a a, a dwarf um, dawn redwood there that the the tag said would only get 12 feet tall, and it hit 12 feet two years in the ground there. So, um, you know, there's always always surprises, and what happens for you in your yard may be a lot different from what happens here or in my own yard. So, any questions before we move off to Asian Valley? All right, we'll go then. All right. First plant is one that's been kind of bumping around the kind of plant collectors for a long time. Rostrinucula dependens. Um, we have it as nodding mint shrub. For years, and it may have even been distributed by the Arboretum at some point under the name Budlia from Gizo province. That's kind of how it was, it was known for a long time. You'd see it in catalogs. Uh, Budlia species and then Gizo in, in parentheses. We finally figured out that it was not a, a Budlia. Um, it is a, a something in the mint family. Kind of an interesting shrub. For us, it's it's generally a dieback shrub. It'll the winters will kill hmm. off the tops and die back to the ground. It'll re-sprout. If you go a little bit warmer, Pacific Northwest, or not necessarily warmer, but not as cold, um, it doesn't die back. It can get to be a big, big thing kind of sucker make just makes a huge mass i've seen them about 12 or 15 feet tall and easily as wide um but but here it's it's actually much nicer for us with as a dieback um plant because it's kind of stays more in in control so even if you have a mild winter and it doesn't die back i say go ahead and cut it back to the ground let it re-sprout it'll flower late it's kind of a neat plant in that um it is uh what they call indeterminate flowering it starts flowering at the back and keeps flowering and the, the, um, it can keep growing, the, the flower stalk can keep growing as it opens up. And if you give it a well-drained soil, but you give it moisture and a lot of fertilizer, you can get these flowers to be, you know, this long. Now only this much of it's in flower, it's all, you know, but it'll just keep going and going and going. And they can get really incredibly long. It's very, very cool. Um, it's called mint shrub. It's in the mint family, doesn't really have any, any uh, fragrance to it. Things in this family often are, you know, deer don't eat as much, but I make no guarantees with that at all. Uh, certainly looks like something a deer would like to eat. Uh, but real easy plant, um, likes full sun, uh, well-drained soil. Any questions or comments? Saw a couple people nodding, so probably a few people have grown this plant. No? All right. Well, like I said, I don't have anything planned, so if you have questions about anything, go ahead and ask me. Question was, what's this plant back here with the great big fruits on there? That's a hardy citrus. Um, that's uh, we've got several of them in there. You can see some evergreens uh, up there that are that are all um, hardy citrus. We kind of planted them with the thought that probably one or two of them might be hardy. Uh, they wound up all being hardy for us. <laughs> so we actually have uh, pictures of somebody with one of our garden carts, you know, like that black cart right there, absolutely filled to overflowing with a bunch of big orange uh, fruits. The, the fruits on all of these are uh, pretty bitter. Um, you wouldn't, most of them, uh, a lot of the hardiness comes from 
Ponsiris trifoliata or now Citrus trifoliata, uh, the, the hearty uh, bitter orange. Uh, so the, a lot of them, the, the rind, the peel is, you know, like three quarters of an inch thick. Uh, but you know, they smell nice. You could dry the, that for potpourri. Um, you can, uh, you can put it in your whiskey sour. Uh, you can make marmalade if you got, you know, a couple 10 pound bags of sugar, <laughs> um, you know, whatever you want. But they're, but they're really pretty plants and they're, you know, the citrus are evergreen. Generally what you need for most of the citrus, even these hardy ones, is a couple of good mild winters or else some protection those first couple winters. We planted these in uh, 2009, 2010, and if you remember, we had some really mild winters for a couple of winters. We got some good growth on them um, and that, that really helps them out. They get some of that wood. If you plant it out, if you get one of these now and you plant it now, uh, even with a not even a very cold winter you'll probably kill it kill it off maybe kill it back to the ground but um, otherwise real easy plants and, and they're they're pretty and you can throw those oranges at somebody <laughs> don't stand under it in a windstorm they're big any other questions about that have they have you ever thought of breeding them in the way to get something that's out of oil really out of oil um you know, yeah. The question was, have you thought about breeding them? We're we're not going to do that. Um, they're just they're just kind of too marginal for us. And and everything that's good and edible is much more tender. So you get this balance of the more you know, the more you try and get something edible in there, the less hardiness you're getting in there. Um, you know, some of the some of the oranges will, will take some moderate temperatures. Um, uh, you know, so it's it is possible. Uh, but not something that we've undertaken. There are a lot of folks who are really interested in it. If you're interested in citrus, hardy citrus, join the, um, the Southeastern Palm Society. Uh, they tend to be, to be really into citrus along with palms. So I don't know that there's a good other organization, but if you get with those, you go to the meetings, a lot of times people are trading um, back and forth, that kind of thing. Come see me, you know, in the, in the winter and uh, I'll give you a, I'll give you a fruit you can take the seed and grow your own out if, if you're still in the area one of the uh, Palm or Palm Society members is a very local guy out in Cary and he did a lecture many years ago about hardy citrus in this area yeah so if you join you have a local cohort very nearby there you go well um, you know they're they're pretty tough there are a lot of oils in citrus they have a lot of them have thorns so um, I think deer would tend to stay away from them. I don't know that at all, but that'd be my guess. They don't eat my Ponceris. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, anything that's marginally hardy, like, like these hardy citrus and things like that, you're better off planting those in spring. Plant everything else in the fall, but plant the stuff that's kind of iffy in the spring as early as you can after the danger of frost is passed and that gives it the most time to, to put out roots to grow, put some growth on um, you don't want to be you don't want to fertilize it a whole lot because you don't want to put out really um, tender new growth but the more roots it has the more top it has the better off you'll be so speaking of bananas uh, this is a dwarf um, yellow flowered banana uh, the edible bananas and these big things are all Musa, M-U-S-A is the genus. This is Musella, uh, kind of the little Musa, uh, Musella lasiocarpa. <clears throat> kind of a neat plant. Uh, it'll Over time, it'll get a little bit bigger than this, but, but a really mature one. I've never seen it much taller than eight feet or so. And uh, that's a little bit of trunking at the bottom and then the leaves that get really big. This one isn't in flower uh, this year. Um, Thing. The flowers are right in the kind of in the middle, so you have to get up close. But they're these big, almost like cones of, of uh, yellow in there. They're really pretty when they're in flower, but you do have to kind of come up and and look for it, unless you have it planted somewhere up high and you can see it. Really neat for adding a little bit of a tropical um, touch to places. You know, it gives you a different texture than uh, than say elephant ears and things like that. Almost more like a canna in texture but without the leaf rollers on there mm. of course also without the big showy flowers on top so can't have everything um 
it kind of comes up and makes a rosette kind of from the, the base, so it gets kind of wider and wider as time goes on. Um, but but a neat little thing, um, kind of got a waxy, uh, waxy leaf, so when it rains, it's real pretty. It's got water kind of hanging on it. Um, grows in sun to, to part shade, uh, pretty easy. Most of the bananas and banana relatives, the more water you give them, they don't want to sit wet, but the more water you give them, more fertilizer you give them, the bigger they grow, the faster they grow. Um, they'll really, it's, they're, it's almost unlimited the amount, if they have drainage, you can just keep putting water on them and keep uh, uh, fertilizing them and they'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Kind of like elephant ears will do the same. Questions about bananas or mucella? Excellent. I'm going in a place that has these uh, this year, so I'm hoping to see some mucella on we shine. We'll see. There's one, um, this one back behind me that's getting uh, fall color on it is, uh, is something that's really pretty new to, to uh, the, the uh, well, it was discovered relatively recently. It is a uh, parodia, um, parodia subequalis. Uh, the leaf is kind of the base, the leaf is kind of offset. That's where it gets subequal, subequalis. Um, parodia it was always was has been known for a long time from the um, uh, Persian ironwood, Parodia persica, which is a really pretty plant, got gorgeous bark, often gets really good fall color. And they, um, this plant uh, had been described in China as a Hamamalis, and then in another hmm. species, and finally they they figured out it's a Parodia, and put it in there. But it really wasn't uh, wasn't rediscovered until. Oh gosh, I want to say it was in the 80s or 90s. It was rediscovered. It had been it thought lost, thought extinct. Um, very protective. It's hard to even get in to see them where they actually grow. But uh, some some propagation material did get out of China, uh, and it roots really easily. Unlike the other parodia, it roots super easy and it grows really fast. Um, and it's it's a very cool plant. I've seen it grown. We grow it as a multi-stem shrub. I've seen it grown as a single trunk tree, where it's kind of this picturesque um, single trunk. Uh, this is just the start of the fall color. It'll keep going. Usually, it gets like almost a dark purple, um, purple black. Uh, really spectacular. Ours has tended to stay. We've got some. I'm not sure of our the the origin of ours. The ulti the original origin of the germplasm. Ours doesn't get as dark as some of the other ones. I actually like what ours does a little bit better. But I was, I was actually uh, a couple of years ago down in Atlanta at their uh, the Atlanta Botanic Garden Gainesville campus, and I was standing and talking to the the director and horticulturist there, and I thought I was standing by a couple of um, purple leaf plums, and I was thinking they'd colored up really nicely, but I wasn't paying that much attention. I realized it was this Protea persica with color as dark as the darkest purple leaf plum you've ever seen. It's really just absolutely spectacular. Mm. Flowers aren't much. It gets little flowers without petals uh, in late winter. Um, they're nice if you get up to them and you know you're, you're jonesing for some flowers because it's late winter uh, but you know they're not gonna stop anybody who's driving by your house for sure. So where are they native? They're native to China. I don't remember where they where they are in China. Um, I want to I want to say it's uh, Yunnan, but I can't believe that they hadn't been discovered until so late. If they were in Yunnan, if you if you if you send me an email, I can tell you because I did a little write up on it once, so I'm sure I, I have it somewhere. I just can't remember. Any other questions? How big will it get? Good question. Um, yeah, parodias tend not to be, they're not huge trees. Uh, they, they really grow more like something in, that's kind of in between a, a shrub and a tree. Even when you see them large, like Parodia persica, I've seen them maybe 35, 40 feet tall. Um, often they're 35 feet wide as well. Um, so this is growing about three times the rate of any Parodia persica I've grown. So, um, you know, in the wild, I, I, I haven't seen like pictures of them, how tall they are, but I see great big trunks, you know, they come up and have a great big trunk and then split off multi-trunk with great big, you know, trunks that way, so, but I don't know. I, I would think it's going to top out 
around 30 or 40 feet though. Um, we have quick couplers. We put out uh, we put out irrigation when it gets really dry. Yeah, um, it's really good soil. It it holds moisture well. It drains, but it holds moisture. Um, so we don't um, you know we like to stress plants out. We want to see how they perform. So we let things go pretty far before we before we start watering them. But we have been putting out some sprinklers in here to keep things alive. How hardy is it? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure exactly how hardy it is. Um, Parodia tends to be fairly hardy, the Parodia persica. I know I've seen this growing up in the mountains in Virginia in a zone six garden, so I'll go at least that far. Um, does anybody know how hardy? Yeah. It grows out of the Osmantha zone, so. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, could, it could probably grow anywhere in North Carolina. All right, I'm, I'm gonna make up a cultivar name. Uh, oh, it's over here. Summer Sunshine. Ah, I was gonna get Sunshine something or other. Um, this is Oryxa japonica. This is uh, Oryxa is kind of a nondescript uh, shrub in in Asia, uh, but it's but it's a, a really useful shrub I think uh, because it'll grow in sun or shade. It'll grow in really dense shade. Grow in sun. Um, but flowers aren't much of anything and normally it's just a kind of a green shrub so this oryxa with summer called summer sunshine is a gold leaf one i think it'd probably be better in some partial shade some shade from the afternoon sun uh, i think uh, we wouldn't get this brown overlay to it um, but it's a real easy plant uh, to, to grow we have a great variegated one called pearl frost which you can see there's a variegated Akuba, so not that one, but behind that, the bigger shrub um, with the white edge to it. That's one called Pearl Frost, uh, which is another great plant. You're really growing it for foliage, not for, not for the flowers. Um, tough as nails, if it starts getting too big, just cut it back to the ground, let it re-sprout. It's got a real distinctive uh, fragrance. Some people like it, some people don't at all. Um, but it's, it's one of the few plants that I could probably identify almost as much by the smell as anything else. Um, especially when you start get, cutting into the wood. But super easy plant, kind of unusual, um, available sometimes from specialty places, mail order places. Alocasia portadora, that's that elephant ear right there, the upright elephant ear. Um, it's a hybrid elephant ear, really good. I grew it for years and it never would come back. Um, we apparently have it in the perfect spot. Uh, it, a lot of the hybrid elephant ears don't form a good tuber. Um, and my experience with Portadora is it does not form a good, a good tuber, and that's what they really want for overwintering. However, um, this one has come back for us for years, and I think that's because we have a slope so it doesn't stay wet during the winter, and it gets uh, as much afternoon sun that soil does um, over the course of the winter and I think it just keeps it warm enough to keep it going um, but yeah it comes back every year now if we had in a lower spot that actually held more water it would get even bigger I've seen Portadora where the tops of those leaves are, are you know eight ten feet tall I mean really massive uh, but um, you know with this the more drainage it stays a little bit smaller but looks pretty darn good for sitting out in blazing Sun and not getting much water um, out here Anybody else have experience with Portadora? Mm -hmm. Just Our, we had it returned for years under a tax sodium. Is that right? It's a stress spot, but it's been like great. Yeah, there you go. It, I was just going to say that new low rider. Uh huh. It's a very nice plant. Is that right? I haven't grown that. That looks good. I want them big. Yeah. I big. I don't know why we shrink them th those down. Uh, no, it's. It's uh, I, I love it. That's one of my favorite plants in terms of texture in the garden, that Portadora. So small would be good. Point out this tr plant. Uh, this is one of my very favorite plants. Don't know why. Nice variegation. This is a holly, Ilex Integra, the entire leafed holly, uh, or Nepal holly. Um, this is one called Green Shadow that was brought up. Uh, over from Japan many years ago by Barry Yinger when he worked at the National Arboretum and worked with um, uh, 
Brookside Gardens. Um, just makes a nice uh, kind of upright uh, pl evergreen plant. It's not super hardy. It's, it's relatively hardy here, but young plants, I've killed young plants during the winter, um, but you get them past a certain size and they're, they're pretty good um, after that. I just think it's a real pretty thing. When it isn't getting crowded by uh, bamboo, it's, it makes a, a real nice uniform shape. Uh, I just, I just like the way it looks. Um, it is a male, so it doesn't, um, doesn't fruit. It'd be awfully nice if you had fruit on this, wouldn't it? Um, but, but unfortunately it is male. I have one from a giveaway. It's, it's in really full shade under a big crate myrtle. Yeah. And it's still small. Is that right? Yeah, it's, but um. It's evergreen, so it looks good. Definitely will grow slower in, in, um, a real shady dry spot. Uh, but but actually it's kind of probably at its nicest in part shade is where it looks the best You don't get you know kind of the the that creamy edge stays whiter in a little bit more shade um, Really just pops a little bit more in, in some shade Questions Well, you know, the question how do you get a female? So, so I, I, you have the, I have the mail from the giveaway and if you some of these you're going to give away more mail so right yeah and so there are different ways variegation works so when you have a splash speckled variegation that's something going on inside the plants a genetic thing um, inside the plant and if and with seed from those plants often you can get some variegated plants out of those not always and sometimes you need to go to the second generation to get them when you have an edge on the plant uh, when you have a white edge or a white, a different color center, that kind of thing, it's what they call a chimera. And that will only translate to the um, offspring if it's in a certain layer of cells. That's where there's a mutation between two different the cells, the chimera, but it's not, um, the cells themselves don't have the, 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 they can't, when they reproduce, they're either going to be the, the, the white or the green have chlorophyll or not have chlorophyll so you can tell on a on a uh, a plant um, not so easy to tell with this one but um, there are basically three layers of cells on leaves there's l1 l2 l3 l1 is the outer layer l2 is the middle layer l3 is the um, uh, I mean sorry l1 is the outer layer l2 is the next layer and l3 is the very middle layer so um, this, you know, is the L1 is where the, the, the variegation is. So there's no green there. And because the edges of the leaf don't have all three layers, because it's, that's the thinnest part, you get the variegation through. If, it's, if the variegation is on the L2 layer, that is the part that makes the, the flowers and the seed pod. So if it's in the L2 layers, you can often get variegations straight from there. This is not in there, so no offspring of this, you know, seed. If you cross this with a female, all the off, no offspring are going to have have any chance of being variegated because it's the the chimeras in the wrong spot. I probably didn't explain that really well because it helps if you can kind of draw it out. But that's why um, with uh, the like purple leaf. Uh, uh, red buds the purple is in the outer layer this is a little bit different because it's a chimera but the purple is in the outer layer so as summer goes on you know it gets green kind of gets that muddy green that's because you have more and more of those that middle layer getting thicker and thicker and showing through the purple there's just as much purple there later in the season as there is early it's just early in the season it's what you're seeing is mostly just that outer layer and as you go on the, the plant puts on more and more of the green in in between there so it gets it's greener and that's why like uh, Denny Werner's Merlot the, the purple leaf one that he did with Texensis in there in the blood that has a thicker leaf all that thickness comes from that middle layer which is green so it it greens up you would need a completely different mutation for it not to do that like you'd need that outside and and second layer to be purple more than everybody wanted to know, right? It's a good way to silence a, a question. 
So I may have talked about this one um, before. I may have talked about many of these before. This is a toad lily. Uh, and this is where it is beneficial, you know, when you go out and collect plants in the wild, you get to see how they grow naturally. And uh, so we collected this Tricertus lasiocarpa in, um, in Taiwan. And what do toad lilies like? Shade, right? So we planted this in the shade, we planted it back over there, and it was pitiful. And I was like, why aren't we getting these huge leaves like you see we would see in Taiwan, where we'd see leaves like this big? And got to thinking about it and realized, hey, this is growing on sunny rock faces. There's moisture coming through, but it's growing in a lot of sun. So we moved it out to this edge, which was sunnier. <laughs> and it started growing really well. Now we need to probably dig this up, move it, you know, over to that side, let it get plenty of sun, and you'll get these huge leaves. They're already, they're still pretty big on this. Um, it's a little bit, it's much sturdier. It doesn't reach. You can see it's all, it's reaching for whatever light it can get out here. Um, so you know, it's helpful to to see them that way. Uh, most shade plants, um, you know, want some of that shade. They'll burn in the full sun. But uh, if you if you feel this leaf. Uh, or feel a plant, you can feel how thick textured this is. It can stand up for a lot of, a lot of um, sun. Um, toad lilies are all really beautiful um, shade or sun plants, depending on the species. Really uh, intricate flowers. It's a great plant for uh, showing kids and showing people who, who never pay attention to flowers may appreciate you know, them kind of in passing. You know, I like to, to take plants like this and show them to my wife who doesn't really care about plants at all. And it's so <laughs> intricate that you can't help but be kind of mesmerized by, by that flower. Questions? Thoughts? All right. I won't even move. I'll just stand right here and talk about this next one that's finishing up flowering. Um, this is one that we've distributed a couple of times, Aster sicimensis. Uh, the Himalayan aster, and uh, I just think it's it's spectacular. It was, you know, it's like my garden. You should have seen it a week ago. Mm -hmm. um, it was absolutely just covered in these pale lavender flowers. Real fine textured plant. You can see from the way it's growing that it would prefer to be in more sun than we're giving it. It's it's reaching for uh, for whatever sun it can get. Um, but a real easy plant in full sun, it'll grow to about 24 inches tall, make a really nice dome. Like a lot of these fall blooming plants, if you get in there in say late June, early July, really don't wanna go past about the first week or so of July and cut them back about halfway, um, you'll keep them smaller. The flower a little bit later even, which is fine for us. We're not gonna get any frost uh, anytime soon. Um, and it'll stand up to some frost, but you get a much more sturdier, uh, uh, kind of more compact plant. I like to do that with Joe Pie weed and, and some of these other fall bloom plants, just cut them back about a third or a halfway back in, um, uh, you know, kind of kind of late June and gives you, a, I think, a, a plant that's usually more suitable for the garden, stands up in the garden a little bit better. Other option is just to plant a whole bunch of stuff around there, let it, um, let all the other plants support them so they don't flop over or anything. Um, sun, well-drained soils, it's about, about all you need for that Aster sicamensis. Does anybody have this from any of our giveaways? How's it doing, Sam? It's really sandy, Is that right? Yeah. I really like it. It's kind of plant that you walk by, you could go up and down Asian Valley for, you know, most of the summer, you're not paying any attention to it, and then all of a sudden, boom, it just, hmm. it knocks you out. But the texture's fine enough that, you know, it's, it's kind of nice with the other things around. We should go plant it by that portadora and it'd be beautiful. Great texture. Any other questions? I got a topic for you. Yeah? I just see a Cuba over there and you're trying to do some Akuba trials. Yeah. You got any comments to add about maybe what you're doing with all the Akubas? Well, trying to get a lot of our Akubas back. So we had accumulated a bunch of Akubas and um, they got planted out uh, in kind of a low spot for trials and we lost quite a few of them. So we've regrouped and our uh, Few of those were our only plants, but we're trying to redo them. Akuba is is one of those plants. I, I give um, I was given a tour to the southern at the southern nurseryman's association southern plant conference where it's all the all the cool plants you know, Everybody's trotting out the newest the best cutting edge 
and I was talking about a lot of those new cool things, but I started talking about Akuba and mentioned, you know, we've got 150 different Akuba and, um, you know, we're evaluating them. And I got raked over the coals by a lot of people. They really made, good naturedly, made fun of me after that, all the speakers, because uh, as uh, a woman in England said, they're kind of parking lot plants, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> to which I said, yes, there are an awful lot of parking lots, you know? So Akuba is one of these tough plants, very easy to grow, grows in shade. Um, you know, people know it, uh, you know, mostly from the speckled, you know, gold dust plant. Uh, but nurserymen sell an awful lot of them. And so our, our, our goal is to really get them out, evaluate them, and figure out what's all the same. Because, you know, 150 plants, 95 of them are green with yellow speckles on there. Um, but, but kind of to see which ones are the best for us. See which ones are female and which ones are male, because that's not very well known. Which ones are actually um, will have fruits. The bright red fruits on a Cuba is really beautiful. I'll tell you this, if it is in any way really cool, like this, like Sulfuria marginata or Hemikikuferin, uh, Dice Case Tiger that have really unusual variegation, they're all male. I have, I have yet to come across one with like a marginal variation, variegation that's, that's female. Um, uh, but there are some really cool things out there. When I've started talking about a Cuba, there are some folks who've got some really cool things that they've just kind of, you know, like nurserymen, and it's just kind of been hanging around to the side. There's somebody local who's got one uh, with bright gold stems. So the, the variegation, that L2 layer, is what actually has the variegation on that plant, which is why it has the gold stems. Um, and it's got a really interesting kind of, uh, kind of variegation. It's, it's really funky. He showed me the plant one time, so I know he actually has it. He keeps denying any knowledge of it uh, <laughs> now. So <laughs> you can sell a lot of Akuba, but you're not gonna make much money protecting an Akuba. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get them to get up off that plant soon. Um, I, I saw the one that you like quite a bit in the lath house at Taylor's for sale recently. Hosoba Hoshifu. Yeah, yeah. Hosoba Hoshifu. Of all the green ones with yellow speckles, the one to grow, if you're gonna grow one, is Hosoba Hoshifu. It's got really thick, glossy, uh, dark green leaves, really bright yellow spots. It's not like, you know, some of the ones that have that are just covered in yellow dots where it just looks kind of washed out and sickly. This doesn't, plus it's got um, hosoba, it means long and narrow in, in Japanese. So it's got relatively long, relatively narrow leaves, really just a an outstanding um, plant. And that one is being produced by wholesale uh, nurserymen around the area. So you can get that one. Hasoba Hushifu. Um, another really nice one uh, is one called Subaru that gets really big leaves. Uh, uh, that's nice. And Suruga Benton. Excuse me, Suruga Benton gets the big leaves. Uh, Subaru is, is a smaller plant that um, stays really nice. Thank you. Akuba. There are plenty of them around. You can wander through. That's pretty. Yeah, isn't that nice? So we're trying to find it, figure out. So there's, there's basically three that we know of with this variegation. Uh, Himikikuferin, Sulfuria marginata, and Limbata. Think Limbata and Sulfuria marginata are probably the same thing. Question is, is Himikikuferin different? Which the person who brought that back from Japan says, yes, it's a dwarf one. But Sulfuria marginata and Limbata tend to grow really slow. Are they really different? Yeah, I don't know that it's different, but. Mm. So we're trying to see if they're if they are actually the same thing, but they're pretty. Very. Who knows what this plant is? I don't. Uh, we we received it as uh, Wisteria, Wisteria sinensis kofuji. We have distributed it as Wisteria sinensis kofuji. Uh, an expert in England tells me this could be either a Miletia oh. or an entirely new genus that they're getting ready to name based on pictures of our Miletia japonica, which they're saying is not Miletia. So we're really not quite sure what it is. Um, but it makes this, it's like a, we always consider it a miniature uh, wisteria. It makes this really nice mound of, of interesting texture. Flowers, but not really well. You don't get a lot of flowers on them. You don't get flowers every year in spring. Um, I don't know if that's a reversion or a seedling. It's gone in there. Um, 
but kind of a neat textural plant. Uh, it's grown a lot as a, a lot is kind of relative term. It has grown occasionally as a bonsai plant. You keep it trimmed back, you can get a real contorted shape. You'll get you know, little flowers on there. So um, it, it, can, it can be done like that. But we distributed it. Um, this is one of those things where, you know, we really thought we knew what this was, but, uh, you know, it's a moving target. We think it's, they stay still, but it's, it's a moving target. Um, you know, they're always, always changing things up. But it kind of illustrates how our, our, um, our collection is important. So the people who are writing this paper in, from uh, the Royal Horticulture Society, you know, got in touch with us because on our website we have phenomenal photos and information. They saw Miletia japonica alba, which we have growing by the um, by McSwain building. And they said, we don't think Miletia japonica is a Miletia. We really like, we're writing up this paper. Um, we desperately need uh, photos and and uh, press specimens of the flowers in this on this plant because it won't flower in England. They don't get hot hmm. enough. So it never flowers for them. So we uh, we provided that that to them, and then they said, "Can you get us seed too? Because Miletia japonica isn't growing in the UK." So waiting for seed to ripen to send them. But they're in the meantime they're writing up this paper based, you know, in part on what we were able to supply them. So we got to talking about this. Uh, they knew this cultivar Kofuji, and they think there's a lot of confusion in it. But again, it doesn't flower in in the UK. Hmm. So they're hoping that. Uh, next year when this flowers we can we can send samples off to them we can kind of you know get some verification on that uh and and that happens uh with pretty good regularity here that people want information about plants that we have and um so we're we're able to help them out as much we, as much as we can so unfortunately we're always sending them to other places which are as poor as us and they don't have you know so nobody ever has a, a fedex number a ups number so we price pay quite a few hundreds of dollars in shipping every year because it's usually international that we're shipping. Uh, but then again, they'll, they'll send us plants too. Talk about this tree here. Uh, this is Aesculus chinensis, it's, uh, the Chinese uh, horse chestnut. This is invariably one of the largest trees I see in China around um, uh, temples and things like that. It'll grow easily easily to uh, uh you know a hundred plus feet tall um it becomes massive and when it flowers uh it puts up upright spikes of of white flowers almost like our bottle brush buckeye um but on this huge tray and a lot of big trees when they flower you don't see them if you've ever seen a tulip poplar when it's young and has branches down low you see these tulip shaped flowers are really pretty once it gets up above your head you never see it this is a plant that when it flowers you see it um, unless you just have so much growing under it that you can't look up but from a distance it is just spectacular in, in flower one of my one of my favorite trees but it gets big and it gets big fairly quickly uh, rarely see it uh, available in the US uh, unfortunately um, you know they're just getting a lot of room for big trees and and all the ohio state fans want esculus hippocastinum you know the the ohio buckeye to to plant out so there isn't much call for this and you really have to grow it from seed and um there aren't a lot of people growing these from seed you can graft it but uh nobody's doing that with this this kind of plant um but but real pretty it what what, what about fall color um, get some yellows on it. It's not real good for fall color. So like a, bottle brush buckeye would be a, lot a bottle brush buckeye would be a lot better for, for fall color for sure. And when does this bloom so I can come back and see once again? In the spring, early spring, relatively early spring. Early to mid spring. Um, I don't know if ours has flowered yet. I haven't seen it. I don't think it has. No? Okay. Yeah. Next year, maybe. Mark, may I mention that Chris has created on the website a way of knowing when it blooms here. You can go to Showtime and enter the first letter of the genus and get to the part of the Showtime display that has your plant and then page down to it. And it has all 12 months of the year color coded with uh, blocks of that color under the mark and that plant has been pictured in the Arboretum 
Okay. Any Assuming it's flowered, of course. Right. So if this is not flowered, it won't be on there. But once it does flower, and if it has, um, we're really busy in the spring. So sometimes yeah. spring flowering things come and go before I even realize it. We, we do have a new volunteer here. Her name is Mary Ann, and she is very vigorously going out and photographing plants for a variety of purposes, including ones we don't have photographs of in flower. Yeah. So we owe her a big thanks for photographing things that weren't in the collection already. Yeah, there's some plants, uh, Chris, Chris every once in a while sends out an email says, please nobody take any more pictures of <laughs> yucca torii or something like that because it's so incredible in flower that everybody takes 20 pictures of it every time it's in flower. <laughs> and so we have like, you know, 500 images of this one plant oh, in yucca. flower. This plant is a plant that, that I'm really fond of. Um, don't see it a lot, but it's a great evergreen plant. You see it in, in Japan grown as a small tree pretty often. This one actually came from, from Chris. I think I was talking mm -hmm. about how much I liked it and we had lost ours and so Chris gave us one. Same with the holly. Oh, is that right? Yep. That's right, the and holly. They're, they're all giveaway plants, so come to the giveaway on Saturday because there's really cool plants. Yes, um, but this is uh, Dendropanix trifidus. And uh, I really like, I've, I've said it before, if, if it has Panix on the name, I generally like it. Um, <laughs> Metapanix, Nothopanix, Oreopanix, Dendropanix. Um, uh, but this is just a really handsome, small, evergreen uh, tree. Usually you can, you can limb it up. I've seen it a, a, as big as maybe uh, 18 feet tall, 20 feet tall, with a nice rounded head. Uh, we'll often have uh, Trifidus three. Uh, it's usually lobed into three parts, but as it gets older, it can become more entire. There's a great big one at the state fair. Um, obviously planted years ago by Tony Avent. Um, kind of by, if you if you go down to where the garden section is, there's a gate that goes out of the fairgrounds, kind of to the side. If you walk in, it's all the way to the left. If you go right down by that gate and look to the right, there's one growing right there, right inside the gate. That's a really good sized one. Often has a bunch of fruit on there. It gets blue-black fruit. Um, and if you, uh, you go grab that, um, you can, you can, uh, you can often do that. So it's in the um, the the ivy family, uh, the Raleigh family. Uh, I think it'd be really fascinating to try crossing this with uh, Fatsia sometime. Mm -hmm. If Fatsia and our and our English ivies cross, they have Fatshetera, which is a, a, a cross of that. I think this would be fascinating to do that. You know, if you could get bigger leaves on a tree-like plant, um, uh, it could be could be very very cool. Grows in in sun or shade. Uh, it's a uh, little kind of somewhat interesting white flowers and then followed by blue black fruits. I saw a couple a couple green fruits on there. Um, uh, real easy to grow, probably not real tasty to, to deer. Guessing. They never yeah. ate it in a pot. Anybody? Deer? They are quite tasty. It's, uh, they are? Uh, <laughs> darn. I was just about to proclaim it completely deer proof. I had to add other when they say otherwise. So plant it where deer don't come, um, <laughs> yeah, that'll be that'll be good. But easy plant. So are there any other questions? Yeah. Well, panix is the the Latin name for ginseng, um, and it's I, I, they put it on a lot of the plants that are in that same family, uh, but not entirely. I don't I don't know exactly. What if it means comes from something else in, in Latin? Yeah, you know, why it was applied to ginseng? So I don't, I don't know. anybody know? Mm -mm. Panics in Latin? No. I have a concluding request, if you wouldn't mind. Can you yes. talk about your upcoming trip? Like who you're traveling with? What what sure. your goals are? What you're hoping to see and bring back? Okay. Yeah. So um, we are. I'm traveling. Uh, so I leave on Saturday, and I'm traveling with. Uh, Scott McMahon, uh, who's been up here to speak, he is the um, the manager of international plant exploration for the Atlanta Botanic Garden, the the only garden in the U.S. I know of who have that position, which they created for him. Um, Ozzy Johnson, who's been a longtime traveler, he's in the Atlanta region. I've known him since I I worked down in Atlanta Botanic Garden, uh, and Dan Hinckley, who's on the West Coast, who used to have Heronswood and now works with Monrovia and, and that sort of thing. He's been here to speak multiple times. And 
Uh, we are traveling. Uh, the first part of the trip, we'll be traveling with one of my friends in China, Liu Gang. He used to do the seed collecting for Shanghai Botanic Garden, and he's now doing it for kind of mentoring young people at the Chenshan Botanic Garden, which just opened up in 2010. Um, we'll also be going with uh, one of the, the the curators for the herbarium from Chenshan Botanic Garden will be going with us on these collecting trips. Uh, so we'll start in Wuyishan, on Wuyishan, Shan means mountain. So there's Wuyi is the city and the mountain right by there is Wuyishan. Uh, Wuyishan is on the border of Fujian and Jiangxi. Uh, we really want to collect on the Fujian side, which is the south side. Uh, because that's where that's going to be wetter and more a little more subtropical going up to temperate but that is the first mountain between taiwan and there so there are a lot of military installations on the south side of Wuyishan. so we'll probably stay on the north side where you know we won't wind up in any chinese prisons um, but if we can get over to the other side we will um then we're going to uh, Xi'an, which is the farthest north I've been, that's where the Terracotta Warriors are. Uh, and going just south of that to Quinling Mountains, which is a really long mountain range. And so we'll be there for several days with Donglin, uh, Dr. Uh, Donglin, who's from University of Georgia. He kind of took Michael Durr's place as kind of the woody plant um, person there. Uh, and so we'll be traveling with him and some of the Chen Shan folks uh, around there. And then uh, we're a little up in the air for the last few days, last four or five days. Uh, we were supposed to visit one area, but uh, apparently uh, the Communist Party is having a, this big meeting where they get together and they decide everybody's fate, you know, who works in the government, which is like almost everybody. So we were supposed to go to, to another area, uh, Jinggang Chong, but uh, the forestry folks who we were gonna be coordinating with in Jinggang Chong said, why don't y'all come next year? Uh, they just don't want any foreigners there, you know, possibly ruining their chances of getting out of the hinterlands. Uh, so we're, we haven't quite decided where we're gonna go. We'll play it by ear. Um, the Chinese really like to do that. Everything's kind of loosey-goosey till you get over there and then, then it all works out. So, um, but we've got, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that we're interested in. Um, I have learned that a lot of times what, what's on my list is not what I actually find. But some of the things I'm really uh, looking for, uh, the Styrax, the Snowbell family has some really interesting things where we're going. Styrax Confucius, and one that I really want, you know, are you familiar with Halesia? Mm -hmm. It's one of our native plants, Halesia, it's got snowbells, the beautiful white flowers. Well, there's one, Asian species, Halesia McGregori. So I'm really interested in getting that, and we'll be in the area with that. And that's a, a snowbell uh, relative. Um, also, uh, at, at much prompting from from Tony Avent, I'll be looking for Lycoris, you know, the surprise lilies, uh, resurrection lilies, naked ladies, whatever you want to call them. There's almost no wild collected Lycoris with collection information. Uh, in the U.S., hmm. uh, we have some seed, some seed that's sown of uh, Lycoris, most likely radiata, the the red one that we collected at Omishan last year, but it hasn't come up for me or for Scott or for Tony. So, um, who knows? Maybe it'll come up. Um, so we'll be looking for for that uh, for sure. There's some really interesting uh, maples uh, in the area, uh, Acer sinensi, uh, Acer. I can't pronounce. It starts with a W. Has I A's, B's, O's. Used. It has a lot of letters <laughs> in it. But um, we'll be looking for that. Another one really high on our list: a plant called Brett Schneidera uh, sinensis, which we had one growing up by the visitor center. And every year it would get about five or six feet tall and then die back to the ground in the winter. Really would like to get one from higher elevations. What hap What it does is, as you're coming out of uh, winter in early spring, before the leaves are on there it flowers and it has these spikes about this tall of pink flowers, white to pink. We're hoping to get a good pink one from high elevation. Um, really absolutely spectacular in flower. So it'd be good to get it because it's very, very hard to find in this country. Um, and it'd be really good to, to get uh, it from as high at elevation as we can. That's, that's the goal. 
So there are a few of the things. I've got I've got lists that are all highlighted and marked up and everything that, that like we're trying giveaway, to get. Right? What's that? Just like the giveaway. Just like the giveaway, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then you always wind up with, with nothing on your list. Yeah, that's that, that's how it usually goes. Do so you need Chinese government approval and US government approval? Well, it depends on where you're going in China. Um, you don't you need a Chinese visa to get in. Uh, you don't necessarily need Chinese government permission unless you're going in, you know, some of the national parks, you have to apply for permits ahead of time. Uh, we work through uh, like Chen Shan Botanic Garden or the Forestry Service or Shanghai Botanic Garden. And so they're, uh, they're really good about, about helping us out with all that. Sometimes it's official approvals. We really try very hard to stay away. Every time you get official approval, you're going to have to meet the officials wherever you are. And that means, you know, usually at least a day, maybe two days of uh, meetings and dinners and a lot of that. It just gets in the way. Uh, so whatever we can, we just we try and get in and out uh, with having as few meetings as possible. Um, sometimes it's, it's unavoidable. Um, but a lot of times, you know, you just go like like any tourists would to, to areas um, it, with with like Chen Shan Botanic Garden or the Forestry Service because they have the permits that allow for plant collecting in those areas. Um, you know, I don't have permits to collect plants and it'd be like going into a lot of places be like going into Shenandoah National Forest and, and collecting stuff which you know they don't want you nobody wants you to do that. Um, other times it really is like if you stopped your car and got out on the side of the road and collected a, some seed off of a maple there. Nobody really cares about that and that wouldn't be an issue. But when we're going off hiking through the woods for a day, you know, yeah, you get you get permissions for all that kind of thing. And the USDA? You can so we um, fill that little card out on the plane coming home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't yeah. been on any farms. <laughs> Never lie about that. I've not been to any farm. I don't go to any farms. Um, so uh, yeah so you you have to have permits from the US that you get from USDA, Animal Plant Health Inspection Services. You get, you get uh, permits from them. And there are several different types of permits, but the main one is a permit to import, uh, the two main ones, permit to import plants and plant parts, and a permit to import small quantities of seed. To import the plants with that permit, you have to get, uh, you have to get the, pl the plants inspected in the country of origin and then they get shipped to a USDA inspection station in the US. Are so they're inspected twice. Uh, you don't carry them with you. I'll get to that. Mm -hmm. The small lots of seeds, you don't need any in-country inspections. They just go straight to the USDA to inspect them and they come on to you. So with China, where it is very, very hard to get permits, we keep being told that we're gonna, that Chen Shan Botanic Garden and the Chinese Academy of Sciences is gonna be able to get us permits to get plants out. I'll believe it when I see it. Um, but so we mostly concentrate on, on seed coming out um, is, is the main thing. If you really have, if you have plants, you really want to get them out, you can. Um, it is skirting the, the law for sure, but some people will go fly through uh, like Thailand or somewhere like that and you can get the permits very easily, the inspections very easily in Thailand. So. The, the inspections are being done, they're, they're being done better in Thailand than they would in China most likely because Thailand ships cut flowers everywhere. So they're very good at that. That's one of the things, one of their main businesses. So mm. they're set up for that. Um, talking about bringing plants with you, uh, have what we, we always call the dirty dozen, which is you can bring a dozen, if you have the permits and the inspections, you can bring up to 12 plants in country with you. But to do that, you have to go through a port of entry. It has to be uh, New York, Miami, now Atlanta, supposedly, Seattle, Houston, maybe. Um, and you can come through with 12 plants. They have a USDA inspection inspector there. However, that inspector is not always there. And if they're not there, they will kill, they will throw away all your plants because if they're not there, customs deals with you and customs says no plants. So, so we don't carry them mail them and I'll usually mail them to here 
mail them to my campus box on, on campus, mail them to my home, try and split them all up so that they, something, something, something arrives. Yeah, uh, you never, and you never know. So I went to New Zealand, spent a lot of time in New Zealand, shipped one package out um, about halfway through my trip, got here just fine. Second package just disappeared. And it happens. Yeah, do they ever come here to collect plants? Yeah, and we've been in talks with them a lot about about coming and, and uh, the, the Chen Shan specifically, Chen Shan folks. Uh, actually, one of the people that I deal with a lot uh, who's at Hancho, uh, uh, wait, Zhejiang University, Zhejiang Normal University in, in uh, Zhejiang province, uh, Dr. Fu, he did, uh, he did all of his PhD research, a lot of other work on Smilax. So he was like, I love North Carolina. You have almost all the American species of Smilax here. Like, hey, more power to you, man. We'll, we'll, we'll let you have all you want. Um, so, so yeah, they, they do come here. Uh, there have been a couple of young folks from Chen Shan Botanic Garden who came uh, and worked for several months at the Atlanta Botanic Garden. We're, next year, we hope to get them up here and work, work here for, you know, maybe a week uh, as well. Um, kind of just an exchange and these, these are young folks who are just who are learning gardening and that sort of thing We're, China does not have China has a long history of horticulture. They don't have a great recent history of, of gardening um, You know at term, they, they're very practical But not necessarily not always aesthetic So they're and they're trying to they're trying to improve that Other questions? Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I will, I'll mention one other thing with wild collected plants. As you go through here, if you see any tag and it says like MWC 14 1095, that means Mark Wethington, China 2014. And that's the, would be the 1095th plant that I wild collected. So you can see that, and sometimes you see BSWJ in a number. That is, we were talking about on November 8th, the speaker, Blethen and Sue Wynn Jones, BSWJ or HWJ. It's Dan Hinckley and Wynn Jones, so Hinckley Wynn Jones. So a lot of times those little collection numbers, you can you can tell something about that. All right, thank y'all all very much.